Yes, sir. Anything? Yeah. So maybe give me question answer, or you can keep the video on. That will be better. Okay, sir. So good afternoon, everyone. So I'm happy to share uh, some of our recent experiences on signal processing. Uh, actually, the, we have been working on the detection of cardiovascular diseases, and we have not really been looking at it as a signal processing activity. But when the request came from Signal Processing Society, thinking, and I felt that yes, most of what we are doing is basically uh, signal processing, and of course. Uh, they could sometimes we call high level signal processing including some uh, classification and uh, deep learning as well uh, coming into this picture uh, so let me try to present our work that we have been doing in the recent past uh, to all of you uh, so this is a brief organization so first i talk about uh, what are our cardiovascular systems and what are the major diseases and why they are a kind of threat for us and then we'll talk about some of the ways in which we can estimate the blood pressure and your blood pressure is a very very important uh, measurement to be made and uh, anybody having hypertension or other diseases immediately doctors immediately take their blood pressure basically what the doctors do is basically they take two uh, two measurements they call it as you know, uh, systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure right so we'll be using these terms again and again sbp and dbp uh, standing for systolic and diastolic blood pressures like normal people will be having 110 70 or 120 80 you know these are typically in the normal range when we say that you don't have a hypertension right? so i'll talk about you know how that could be that have been estimated over the years and what are the current approaches and these days we actually try to uh, estimate not only these two quantities which are called systolic and diastolic blood pressure but what we actually call as a blood pressure wave which looks like this so typically a blood pressure waveform uh, it looks like this where the up highest topmost place is called the systolic blood pressure and the bottom part is called the bottommost part is called the diastolic blood pressure so typically using the stigma manometer technique which doctors use they we, they can actually measure these uh, these two levels by listening to the uh, the oscillations within the manometric system and people have been satisfied for many years with these two measurements because nothing better could be done but more recently you know there is a uh, and there is an interest to actually estimate this blood pressure signal right so when we say signal is basically this type of a signal and that is actually not such an easy task, right? Especially uh, we, as I explained to you that there are some more restrictions put in, like we don't want it to be an invasive measurement. In fact, the so-called arterial blood pressure can be measured only by some inv in, in, uh, invasive process where you actually will have some probes uh, put into your uh, arteries. And from there only you can actually measure the blood pressure just like we can measure the pressure of a water supply or rate of flow of water by just putting a manometer in the uh, in the pipe uh, so that kind of instrument actually we can we cannot put actually in human body just like that so we'll talk about that and then we'll describe some of the approaches that we have tried and some of the approaches, you know, that is basically we have also tried to assess the uh, existing approaches and we did not really feel them to be very powerful as of now. But we'll talk about it and then we'll uh, share what are the things that we have been trying to do uh, in our case. And then I'll go a little bit deeper and there will be reason, you know, as we'll explain these two problems, I'll explain to you why we need to go a little bit deeper into the uh, cardiovascular system that we have to understand what is happening inside the body as we make some out external measurements modeling is very very important and when we model it then we can actually use that to detect various diseases like the coronary artery disease and we will call it again with an abbreviation cat cad 
and then we'll talk about some more signal processing and how we can detect cardiac abnormalities using the so called electrocardiograph signal ecg or uh, phonocardiogram signals the pcg right so so i'll try to cover the gamut of all these uh, signals and uh, finally try to conclude with recent trends and what i'll call as fashions and then try to and give you some references as well so to give you a history so why cardiovascular disease is important as you can see since you know 2000 and probably even before that and and even more recently uh, you can see that cardiovascular disease is actually the number one uh, reason for death in fact the number of people who die of cardiovascular disease in fact has increased uh, over this last 20 years or so and in fact uh, of course this uh, reasons like a cancer also it has also increased overall it has increased but in fact it has increased more on the other hand respiratory diseases have been managed in a little bit better way so there is a decrease but neurological disorders again have got gone up right and treat kidney diseases and all that and diabetes and all they have also gone up so many of them have gone up but cardiovascular disease is still hold number 1 so this is the worldwide figure and indian figure is not different in fact you will see that the indian in fact the increase in cardiovascular disease the increase is even more right the one was 30% increase over the last last two decades right and here respiratory diseases have been more in fact it was number 2 here still number 2 but it is uh, percentage wise little bit it has gone down on the other hand cancers diabetes etc they are all rising right so these are all rising so it is very important uh, to control the cardiovascular diseases and we doesn't have a strong cardiovascular system uh, many other diseases can happen so that's also an issue so uh, it is like you know the card blood is flowing through the body and it is carrying oxygen so if it is not happening properly you know a lot of other portions in the body will start in fact in the era of covid 19 as you all know that people are have those weaker cardiovascular systems are said to be more susceptible and having are going and apparently having more difficulties to recover so it's very important to have a, a strong heart right and cat cat is again a particular cardiovascular disease right and so that also is a serious threat and since we are going we are going to talk more about cat especially in terms of disease uh, detection uh, so let me mention that both worldwide as well as uh, country wide uh, you can see that 16% of the people both worldwide and country wide they uh they were vulnerable the susceptible to cat and stroke is also another uh, disease due to a cardiovascular problem also in the sense that blood flow in the brains actually a lack of blood flow in the brain can cause a stroke so these two together constitute almost 27% of the uh, all the life threatening diseases so how how do we go about it so there are a lot of uh, signals that we can actually use uh, for detecting diseases especially we are interested to detect diseases before they become uh, life threatening right so early detection is always very very welcome so if we have our uh, you know if we consider the human heart and the cardiovascular system at the center a few signals which have been always been used Uh, for detection of diseases is the the let's say it, the first one that comes to our mind. In fact, the doctor will immediately order an ECG to you if you are going to have high blood pressure and you have some chest pain or something. It's not that it can actually detect all the diagnose all the diseases, but it can actually give you an indication. So there are many uh, you know diseases. I'm not going into the details of all the names, right? In fact, I may not be even able to. we will to pronounce all of them without any problem because uh, the literature 
right so there are various types of malfunction of the heart right and uh, since we work on coronary artery disease we are little bit more familiar with it so basically artery disease is if you have some kind of plaque formation in your arteries right and especially the coronary arteries which is providing blood to the heart right for the for pumping the heart muscles right uh, so that kind of uh, blockage in those coronary arteries in fact anybody having uh, some angioplasty etc would probably be having it in the coronary artery only because that is where it becomes a problem because heart has to pump blood to the entire body but heart has to be operated by the coronary i mean has to be supplied by the coronary artery so if there is any disease uh, it is like the you know like the muscles of the heart itself do not work so that creates a big issue so I mean, a lot of efforts have been have been made in fact even uh, physical and mental stress can be detected from ecg the another one which is uh, conventionally used by doctors in fact doctors listen to the heart right so they put their stethoscope in the ears and then they listen to what is happening in fact uh, they can actually detect lots of diseases especially what are called you know so any valve is not working by listening to the sound of the heart they can figure out whether there is a valvular or valve disease right whether there are murmurs right we we'll come to this kind of things even more in fact we will come to we will have a section on ecg where we will talk about how many of the them are those are getting automated right and and also coronary artery disease and this is increasing in fact uh, these days the tendency uh, is always try to do things with uh, this kind of signals which are uh, so called non invasive right you just listen right you don't disturb anything in your heart you just put a sensor close to your heart sometimes you don't need to even put it on the body you can just keep it close to it right and if you can get a signal from there there nothing like it because you know even pre covid days we wanted non invasive treatment and post covid days i'm sure nobody would like it you them be touched unnecessarily and then there is a signal which is uh, the one i talked about in the beginning the so called arterial blood pressure signal so this arterial blood pressure signal is invasive right that is you have to put some probes inside your body to measure it but the good thing about it is that you can actually uh, detect various things like blockage or stenosis uh, right or various uh, in uh, irregularity in the heart beats and things like that right and atherosclerosis which is again a kind of a plaque formation all over the arteries in the system and uh, you know again many other things uh, as the doctors you know describe them in this fashion right so lots of diseases are actually possible to be identified if you can actually get the blood abp signal and that is the reason we will try to figure out how to get that abp signal from other kind of non invasive measurement right so if you can actually get this abp signal by kind of combining signals from ecg ppg and maybe other signals right then uh, we actually we can uh, we can actually access all these uh, i mean detect all these diseases so that is the thing that we are all trying to do so so if we just have the ppg so called photoplethysmogram signal in fact Uh, if you go to the emergency of a hospital you will see that uh, they will just put a probe onto on your fingers and give you a picture of that also on the fingers they will put a probe and that will actually give you the blood pressure at least systolic diastolic blood pressures and things like that and from here also this signal is now actually going is very much in the sort of news because you can actually in fact as i will show that you can actually get abp signal kind of predict the abp signal if you can have it maybe along with some other ecg signals and things like that and once you can do that once you can estimate this abp signal whatever abp can do ppg can also do right? and ppg is uh, you know non invasive non invasive in fact all these ecg 
PCG and PPG, these are all uh, non-invasive to some extent. And, and then I'll ex explain in another chart that, you know, in fact, these days that tendency is to have signals which are non, um, in fact, these are inobtrusive, in 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 right? You do not even know that they are actually there and they'll still can get the signals. So these are the this is a gamut of you know, cardiovascular signal processing so far that I've come across. And so we can do a lot of things once we get the uh, these measurements properly. So as I was telling that uh, you know uh, there have been a lot of instruments, especially earlier days instruments used to be invasive instruments, right? You put some uh, probes inside the body and then you measure the blood pressure right and then uh, then they, they came this so-called arterial line so in your wrist right you have arteries so if you can put a probe by making a little incision to the there if you can measure the blood pressure then you will get an exact blood pressure at that point right? but then again this could be done only in an icu type of environment when you are admitted to the hospital now, you would not like your blood pressure to be taken in this fashion if you are just going for a for a casual visit right so so from 60s we have these so-called cuff based measurements right we have wrist cups right arm cups or even finger cups are there so basically what is done is a in the is the same principle which doctors use for measuring the blood pressure is automated right by method called tonometry basically doctors listen to the tone of the signal so this can be also automated by increasing by using a method where you can have a you can apply pressure from a control source and then slowly raise the blood pressure external pressure and then whenever it matches the systolic and the diastolic blood pressure then the tone changes so the instrument can detect that and then in, uh, in the 70s a method called volume clamp in fact We'll go into a little bit more detail about it because this is uh, there is an instrument called Fina Press, which uses this technique. It's a, there is a patenting patented technique uh, where you know you can put a finger uh, in the pulse plethysmogram signal you know, sensor in your finger, and then by adjusting the pressure on your finger, you can measure the uh, pulse plethysmogram, uh, plethysmogram signal in a very in a quite accurate fashion and from there you can derive many other quantities like the uh, arterial blood pressure cardiac output and various other things right and of course these days we are trying to have more cuffless right so, so we'll see whether that is possible or not and still uh, i do not think any technique is there where uh, it's really fully cuffless methods are working. In fact, uh, this Fina press method comes close to it where there is a finger cuff, but time to time it needs to do a calibration so that it does not go out of uh, sing, sing, uh, calibration with, uh, with the blood pressure. And, and so that creates the gaps in the measurement, especially when you are interested to find the arterial blood pressure signal. Right? And then we have to figure out ways to fill up those gaps. So I'll talk about that in an example. And this is a little bit of an you know, overview of some of the recent approaches. So if you have multiple signals like PPG, ECG, and sometimes you also add your knowledge about the system in the form of a model, right? And people try to estimate the arterial blood pressure from these signals. You know, sometimes, you know, people take two uh, places they put they take PPG signal, plethysmogram signal from two places in the body, and then they get quite a good accuracy. Especially if they combine that with the, the, the ECG signal, then uh, you know one of the recent work, basically they combined the effect of you know the basically they get so called PAT signal. I'll give you, I'll show you a diagram where these are all explained in a better way, and heart rate, right? And from so they could measure it quite accurately. Then there are other approaches where you use a model and a PPG signal, or you uh, use some other model. You know, 
two different papers have been there in the uh, recent past. In fact, this one uses some deep learning CNN based method. And then we have uh, another one where actually you take the PPG signal and construct what is called the pulse wave velocity. And there you then try to estimate the blood pressure. Right. And the accuracy of these, they vary. But the first one, especially you will see that is a very, uh, has a very good accuracy because, you know, if you have uh, 100, uh, the nominal values of your blood pressure, if they are in the order of 100, so if one or two millimeter variation means 2% variation, which is very, very good, right? But you can see that here actually, you need two PPG signals and one ECG signal. So that is a lot of overhead. On the other hand, you know, many others which use a single PPG signal, the accuracy is not that good in the sense that they're more than 5%, right? And more than 5% is actually uh, not acceptable from clinical terms. So you, if you build an instrument which is having this much of error, it will not be clinically acceptable. Uh, this one actually, of course, this is a deep learning based system. So according to the way that deep learning people, they write the accuracy, this happens to be 97%. Uh, but this is more like a, uh, you know, classification problem that they have solved. So it is, I mean, written an error of 3%, but it is not a consistent error, right? What will happen is in some cases, the error may be large. In some other cases, error will be small. So it is not the maximum error. Similarly, there, this one is again one PPG based measurement. But again, you see that the RMS errors are quite high, right? Again, these two are of the same order, right? And which is what we have also experienced in our approaches that the most of the approaches there are RMS errors in the so-called systolic blood pressure will be of the order of eight, nine of that order. So according to the American Association for Cardiologists, they have a standard of what is called, they call it the gold standard which is that the error should be within plus minus five millimeters. So as I was telling, so what is this PAT or these kind of signals? So basically this is how the various signals look like. So many of you would have uh, come across this ECG signal, right? There is a peak which is many of them, many of us actually refer to it as R peak because what we do is actually we, uh, we mark different points as Q, R, S and things like that, right? So P, Q, R, S, T, yeah. and like that we define the uh, various parts of the ECG signal. So this R peak is a very important parameter and it is very easily detectable, right? Because it's a huge peak. Uh, depends on which lead you are take, is looking at, but most leads will allow you to see this signal. And ECG or the so-called phonocardiogram signal uh, looks like this. It is a little bit more noisy, uh, but whatever you want to hear, right, that will happen in some parts which are called, you know, so-called S1 peak and S2 peaks and things like that. I hope I am getting it. So this is called S1 peak and there is another peak which is called S2 peak, right? So these two places are very important to observe, right? And there are, uh, this is probably a healthy signal, so you don't see much oscillations, but especially with the disease people, there, there will be a lot of oscillations near the S1 peak and S2 peak. And by listening to that sound, doctors can figure out whether there is a disease. Now this PPG signal or photoplethysmogram signal, right? So this is a, uh, this signal actually looks similar to the arterial blood pressure, right? You will see that arterial blood pressure uh, signal uh, also as I have drawn it, looks like this. In fact, PPG in a more pure form will also look like this. Right? So there'll be a peak and uh, there'll be a trough and in between there'll be a, uh, notch type of thing, which is called dichrotic notch. Right. So in fact, 
many PPG signals, nicely one, nice ones will take any, they will take and they will also have a notch, right? So basically the PPG to ABP, there is a lot of similarity, but we need to have, there'll be factors and then there'll be delays, especially you can see that the peak of the PPG comes much after the so-called R peak, right? This is the R peak, first R1, then you can see this is R2 and so on. So first R peak to PPG, so this gap is called EAT, right? This is the pulse arrival time. This is full form is pulse arrival time. And there is a uh, small period which is called, which is the between the R1 peak and the S1 peak of the ECG is called the pre-ejection period, right? And this gap between the S1 peak to the peak of the PPG is called pulse transit time. Okay, I think it's not necessary to remember all this right now. And I'll come, we'll come to specific cases where we I'll define it as well. So this is just to give you a preview of the various signals that we come across in the in processing to be processed for detecting various diseases. So as I was stating that there is a relation between uh, this blood pressure and this uh, uh, pulse transit time. Okay. So their formula actually there is a there is an empirical relation where you can see that there is a pulse transit time and the blood pressure, right? So there is a logarithmic relationship between them with some coefficients along with certain other parameters which depend on the physiology of the person, right? So it looks like this. So pressure is equal to K1 times log of ETT plus some K2 where uh, you know K2 is this function, right? Which is a function of the length of the artery, and various constants, density of the blood, elasticity, and things like that. So on an average, you you know, they have more or less, I mean, they become a kind of offset, right? So what will happen is that from, uh, suppose, so you, you can see that if you are taking the measurement in some place in the US, right? There the size of the artery and the length of the artery, those things will be different in a normal person, right? and consider that with India, right? So what will happen is that these constants will be different potentially. And if you want to use this formula, you have to uh, take care of it by doing sufficient experimentation in each of those countries. So you have to do, um, you know, properly, you know, anth proper anthropological surveys and figure out what are the places uh, where they are uh, body structures are different and for each structure, what will be the kind of arterial sections that we're going to have. So what we tried to do is that we wanted to try it out uh, from uh, signals, right? And in fact, what we did is that we, uh, we use the ECG and the PPG signals uh, from data available from Physionet, right? Physionet. And then we try to see if, if whether this kind of formula is correct or not, right? How accurate it is. So we actually from the signals, PPG, we measured the, from ECG, we got the heart rate. And from ECG and PPG, we got the so-called PAT, right? Remember, we should be, we should have been using PTT, right? Which is the actual formula. But since we did not have the PCG measurement, right? So we use the PAT, right? So we, since we have the ECG and the PPG, so we could only get the PAT, right? PTT, basically this pre-ejection period is unknown to us, right? So we had to use some alternative, whatever is available. Later on, we have also tried with uh, PTT in place, and but even that doesn't uh, change things much. So once we have this, we try to find the, correlated, the correlation between the, these variables like heart rate, PAT, and blood pressure. And then we define some um, correlation coefficients, right? But unfortunately, we actually found that the you know, correlation values are quite inconsistent, right? 
in fact we had different subjects right uh, seven subjects here and you can see pat uh, correlation versus sbp dbp you know they are quite erratic right and so is that with the heart rate as well right and there are different reasons for that firstly the uh, for getting a good correlation you need to measure these time periods accurately but what we found later on that this physionet database does not have accurate timing information so even if ecg signal and ppg signals are available for the same patient right the they are they are not time synchronized so there is a scope of error and then there is another issue which is that you have if you have people in the icu right because this physionet data a uh, physionet contains lot of data where these patients are in icu right so icu patients are under medication and their their heart rates and their uh, blood pressures none of them are in the normal range so it did not really give us a very satisfactory answer result in fact if you want to predict the systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure they come quite accurately but the problem is that uh the error is not consistent and has a very funny kind of pattern right so this is so called you know bland or altman plot where you are actually we actually plot the average value of the estimate versus the difference between the estimates and ideally it should be a random kind of plot right but you can see that this is seeming having a pattern kind of you know linear pattern both sbp and dbp that means this is not a good estimation estimation so as i mentioned so it's not very easy although theoretically it's possible to calculate it from this formula right so if you have to measure the ptt that is then you require three sensors you need ecg then you need uh, pcg and ppg and we also tried fitting the blood pressure as a non linear function of pat even that in help so as i mentioned so sync lack of synchronized data collection is actually the main reason for the poor correlation right and so what we failed is that uh, we need to improve on this technique and so one of the things that we tried more recently uh, so basically this was was a kind of a negative result that we published in last year's emvc and this year we tried to change our approach and we tried to use a linear transfer functions approach rather than using a you know empirical formula type of approach right so uh, what we thought is that uh, if we have our system right our physiological or cardiovascular system right and if if you have if you have both measured abp and measured ppg then can we not fit a transfer function model between them right with the measured abp as the input and the ppg as the output and then we will minimize the error and then we will be able to estimate the transfer function right so basically we are trying to model the process of estimating or measuring the ppg right so this can be also looked at like a what is called as a wind kessel model a compartmental model where you know arterial blood pressure is actually kind of passing through a filter and the filtered output is our ppg signal right so where you know these parameters you know al r c and all that will depend on the various factors like inertia of the blood resistance of the blood flow compliance of the artery and viscoelasticity and things like that so if we can actually know this kind of equivalent circuit right that is lying between the abp and the ppg then we should be able to reverse the problem right and then Get uh, you know solve the inverse problem, right? So if you know the model, right? So if your model is the ABP and you can get the PPG, so by inverting the model, you should be able to get the ABP when PPG is given. So we tried this out, 
And this worked actually quite well. And this year actually, Ashutosh has got another paper in EM, EMDC. So where we actually estimated this transfer function. In fact, we tried to estimate it both ways, ABP to PPG and PPG to ABP. And as expected, these two transfer functions are actually inverses of each other. Right? The gain constants are inverses. This, this, are, this is this constant. There is a typo also here. So anyway, these all others you can see they are matching. Right? There is probably a zero missing somewhere from this. Okay, so you can see that if you have both ways, we have the models, then we should be able to predict one from the other quite accurately. And that's what happened. Right? So this is this shows ABP is the input and PPG is output, right? And they are coming very close to each other. And this shows PPG as input and ABP as the output. They are also coming quite accurately. And so we did it for uh, multiple subjects, right? And we determined the accuracy of training, accuracy of fitting and uh, testing, right? And, and so two ways, one is the arterial modeling, which is ABP to PPG. And ABP estimation is from PPG to ABP. So you can see that you know these accuracies are not too bad. They're of the order of you know at least around uh, 80 to 90 percent, right? Which is much better than the kind of correlation that we got earlier, right? And the sigmas are also reasonably small, right? So we, in, in fact, we saw we have put it in the uh, bland Altman uh, form, right? And you will see that these are all flat, right? So uh, this has a much better uh, response and you can see that the correlations are also quite good. So it's a linear fit, right? And that way we could get a much better response. And the same way for another subject, we could also see the same type of plot. So this is a recent paper that got published in EMBC this year. Now I'll come to something very uh, kind of interesting that we came across while using the data from a FinaPress instrument. So as I've been mentioning, this is an instrument which actually you know, helps us to estimate ABP signals from PPG signal. First, I'll explain you know, what is the approach that is used and what are the limitations. So basically what is done is that you, you, we put a you know, IR probe on the finger, right? infrared uh, LED is put, and then uh, there is a detector is put. Right? And so we can actually check, uh, see the kind of uh, the, uh, the, uh, the optical output actually depends on the, uh, the, the arteries which are there in the finger. Right? So with blood pressure, the size of the artery keeps increasing and decreasing. Right? So this pulse uh, plexismogram signal or the infrared optical signal they, the, the output changes with the size of the artery, right? As arteries flatten, uh, they get expanded, you, you get a variation expanded and contracted, you get a variation in the optical output, right? So if it is uncontrolled, right, then the variations can be shown in this fashion, right, PPG signal. But what happens, I mean, and how actually it is used to estimate the blood pressure is that by putting an external force, or pressure by an external pressure along with the IR sensor, if you could actually manage to track this variation, right, then we can actually minimize these oscillations, right? So if we can keep it, uh, if we can actually stop the oscillations by uh, keeping the arteries, by, by balancing the internal pressure with an external pressure, then the, there'll be no variations in the pulse plethysmogram signal. Right. So that is what is done, that using some feedback and fast feedback, the, an external signal is put, which looks like the 
uh, which would actually look like the uh, arterial blood pressure because this is the force which is externally applied and that nullifies the effect of the arterial blood pressure. So the measurement that we get is a kind of uh, pseudo measurement for the arterial blood pressure. So this is what is done in the uh, FINA press instrument. But what happens is that uh, time to time uh, we actually release the pressure to make sure that uh, the system is in calibration, right? Because the person's blood pressure over the day or, uh, or due to the various uh, issues in the, in, the, in the cycle of the, in the control loops of the body, the blood pressure signal actually you will see that you can say it is not a constant, rather it has some kind of an envelope, it follows some kind of an envelope, right? And there will be variations over the day and things like that. So one setting will not be able to control for the entire cycle over the day. So time to time there is a calibration done, right? So in that at that time the feedback is released, right, or interrupted, and then we sort of re uh, and, and let we we'll allow the control to uh, again closed loop control to take over and then again synchronize itself, right? So whenever that happens, in between temporarily we'll allow a little bit of pressure variations, PPG signal, but even then after that again we make it flat, right? So this is a very good uh, measurement. Only thing is that it has these gaps in between. So we thought initially in a naive way, we thought, okay, how can we fill up the gaps? Because this looks like some you know pattern is visible. So can we not figure out the pattern and then fill up the gap? So we tried to, uh, you know, so this is the kind of signal that we get, right? So basically a few cycles of the ABP, they are missing. Right? And as I said, that there will be these patterns, right? So you can really see this, uh, these patterns, right? So if you can figure out the patterns accurately, then right, you will be able to fill up those missing points, right? But as we tried to delve deeper, we found that it is not such a trivial problem. And so what we tried is that we just uh, took the raw ABP signal, right, like this, and then we uh, did a low-pass filtering, right? And then we detected these cycles, right? So these, uh, so first cycle, second cycle, third, like that. Each one we counted and detected those cycles, right? And then we saw we identified segments where there uh, continuous good signals are available, right? And then we uh, identified the first and the right last uh, segment of good, uh, good cycles of each segment right and then uh, for each uh, cycle actually we then figured out that the, if we have to interpolate so the last cycle of the previous cycle and the first cycle of the next cycle they have to be connected by some method so we have all these segments good segments now we have those pieces are available and then we have to connect them through some means. So how do we do that? So because we need, we, ha we have some information missing here, right? Right. And also we found, found out that uh, even a person who's having a normal heart rate, these intervals are not exactly constant, right? So how can we find out the exact uh, intervals? So we can do that from the ECG signal, right? So if we take the raw ECG signal, Right, again, as I mentioned, these are these R peaks, etc. there, right? So gap between these will tell us what is the current uh, interbeat interval or heart rate. Right? So if we can get it from the, we, we detect the peaks in those uh, R, uh, you know, the ECG signal. And from there, we actually uh, find out, so within this gap, right, how many such, uh, ECG signals will fit. How many complete ECG signals will fit? First, we find that out. So it will be two, three, four, or maybe more sometimes. Right? And uh, the time periods of each signal, because we know the corresponding, these two must be synchronized. Right? So from here, we'll pick up those corresponding cycles, intervals, in which we actually have, have to fit in the LEP signals. Then find out what is the number of cycles, number of samples, and then 
we can actually use some kind of a linear interpolation to start with and i'll tell you that this is not really a very good method but it's a good way to start and then we can actually fill those up right by putting some kind of interpolation right? so this is the algorithm we thought of and which is still not perfect because as i show you so if you have this kind of a segment right uh, theoretically you can fill up right but there is a disadvantage in fact i am not sure whether you can figure out but it is quite possible especially if your uh, length the gap is large it is quite possible that this could have come down and gone up right and then things done like this right in some way it would have it could have happened in different ways because in, in this interval actually we have under sampling right so anything uh, you know from signal processing any place where you are doing under sampling the variations could be happening anyway in fact we also found out that uh, there are other uh, effects artifacts like breathing right respiration or or something which is called as the meyer wave right which are some oscillations which just seem to be visible in arterial blood pressure signal right so this approximation so far whatever we have done this linear interpolation is not able to take care of it so currently we are looking at uh, you know incorporating these other features right uh, which will help us in giving getting a better approximation right and basically it means is actually a more deeper study about the physiology so as i was mentioning that signal processing you know a lot of things look like signal processing from the outside but once you go and try to dig deeper you see that basically you need to go into the physiology of the persons and so on right so so that will be the next topic so how do you go uh, and fill up these gaps in a more scientific fashion and by a deeper study or we may call it deeper learning deeper study or modeling so we would like to represent this as a kind of modeling uh, exercise right so i'll just give you a very brief idea about how we model the cardiovascular system and then how do we estimate the parameters in that system so so let me just before i start because uh, on this topic let me ask my uh, hosts so what is the time available for me because i seem to be going a bit slow compared to what i thought and are already around 45 minutes past so what is the time limit sir we have 15 more minutes a uh, 15 more minutes right yes okay. yes sir so okay then what will happen is that i'll probably stop uh, after some time and uh, instead of trying to cover everything i'll stop after talking about the cardiovascular system and if people are interested when well, i can give a second talk or you know maybe uh, provide a recording of the rest or something like that i okay, will come to that okay okay so talk about cardiovascular system uh, i think all of you have studied uh, taken a look at the on the heart and the you know the blood circulation in our body right so we have uh, in fact two parts of the heart right right part and the left part so left part has left ventricle through which actually you know blood comes out and then go, goes to the entire body right and then uh, then finally they on return they actually uh, so this is the arterial network right and this this is the veins network right so so the oxygenated blood which is shown as red goes to the arteries and then they return uh, through the veins becoming blue that is they are deoxygenated and then they enter the right part of the heart and then uh, then they go to the uh, lungs through the so called pulmonary arteries right and they are still blue because pulmonary arteries are still carrying the deoxygenated blood so this is still blue right and then they get cleaned up right they again get uh, distributed into the uh, various 
beds of the capillary beds of the lungs and and then they they get the exchange through the gas exchange process they exchange the carbon dioxide with oxygen and then they become red right so oxygenated part again comes to the uh, right atrium as so a left atrium and then uh, it goes to the left ventricle and then gets pumped to the body right so this is the overall idea right so we can have some different types of modeling of the cardiovascular system right and so basically you can say the right part of the heart the left part of the heart and the pulmonary vascular bed right this part right where oxygen gas exchange is taking place this is the right part of the heart left part of the heart right and with a lot of simplifications and overall you know systemic bed right the uh, basically the body through which the blood is actually getting distributed blood is giving up oxygen and then getting carbon uh, carbon dioxide from different parts of the body so this is how the various parts of the heart can be modeled right and just like any transportation process you have this resistance to the flow right and capacities or capacitance to store the uh, as reservoir of the flow right so you know a very simplified model could only have resistance and capacitance but they are not adequate to represent all types of phenomena right so heart itself is like a time varying capacitor and the beds are modeled with capacitors and resistors and there are also valves right you probably know about the heart valves right that is from atrium to the ventricle and so on there are a lot of valves mitral valves and things like that so all of the valves are uh, actually represented as diodes maybe with a resistance in series and some certain things are also ignored in the simplified model so this could be a very simple model and but, but even then the estimating the parameters of uh, all these uh, resistance and capacitance is not a trivial matter one of the reasons is that uh, from the available measurements you cannot actually estimate all the uh, measure all the parameters okay so our goal would be to estimate the parameters so every you, a person or subject is coming or a patient is coming and you need to determine these or her parameters right then you have to make some measurements and from there you have to estimate the um, parameters for that particular person right so you may need some estimation technique like least squares especially non linear because the models will be non linear and then you will actually check whether those uh models that, that you are getting whether they are actually making sense right and and then since as i said all the parameters may not be sensitive enough right so you may do need to do some kind of a sensitivity analysis right to find out um, which are the sensitive parameters so i'll show you a case study where i'll actually explain these things So you can have various models of uh, you know the earlier model was too complex. Uh, here actually we just have a model of the left ventricle, right, and that of the systemic vascular bed. In fact, you can actually see that this could be model like a maybe with a third order model with just three capacitors, right? Three capacitors will help us to get a third order model, right? Even these kind of models they provide us a reasonably good uh, estimate of the physiology right so what it can give us is actually the it can if we initialize it properly it can give us the arterial blood pressure waveform right or at least an approximation of it and we have to initialize the parameters carefully with the height weight and gender and uh, other quantities right to get a good accuracy and and the if we get an ecg signal then it, uh, we can actually use it for uh, generating what is called as an elastance function right basically elastance is uh, this quantity is basically the uh, variation of this capacitance is captured by an elastance function so you can actually uh, model it as a function of the ecg signal that gives us a uh, reasonably good accuracy 
but the model could be a little bit higher order and unless it is a little bit higher order certain phenomena cannot be captured you can see here that here we have also put an inductor right so if you recall that once we mentioned about the abp signal having a notch right and we observed that unless this inductor is there we cannot actually uh, get this notch in our model right uh, so using that let me show the results that we got uh, because that actually um, requires an oscillation internal oscillations to happen so we need lc oscillations for representing that so some of the ecg signals may, some of the abp signal may not have a notch while some of them may have a notch right and if you have an inductor then it is possible to approximate with an inductor or the notch can be approximated with an inductor now so we may ask, so what is the uh, what is the advantage of doing this uh, modeling right so we actually did a study on classification of coronary artery disease versus uh, people having no disease can we really distinguish between them through the use of a model right so we had set up a model in fact this model has been uh, done by our earlier uh, researcher karan dr karan jain uh who actually provided this model so what we did is that we fed the ppg signal right and the uh, systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure values remember these are individual values and these are not the waveforms right our target is to uh, generate the waveform so waveform will come here right and right. of course you see that here we have not used an inductor so the notch will not be there so more like it will be a flat kind of waveform right but even that gives us a lot of ideas about the behavior of the person right and uh, to improve the classification we also try to use something which is called as a metadata so this metadata Could be like you know the gender of the person. I don't know why it's not coming instead. Oops. So this metadata. So there is some problem here right now. Okay. Sometimes it is coming. Sometimes it is not coming. Okay. Okay. So this metadata is actually uh, age and other parameters. It's like you know, we check also whether the person is smoker or not and things like that. So using all of that, right? We actually enter them into a feature table, right? And then we actually get certain quantities uh, from the model. right and using that we train the system with the five pole cross validation and then do a testing right and then we this is a closer view right so as i was mentioning that you know, all the parameters it's not possible to estimate right only some of the parameters are more sensitive right and we try to estimate those more sensitive parameters okay right? and the remaining ones we try to initialize them in a uh, in an appropriate fashion right so this was a work published by karan few years back and so we went further and try to use it for detecting cat right so some of the parameters which became relevant are these quantities right and some metadata like as i said age smoking and whether the person has diabetes or chest pain and things like that right so using them we actually could identify quite accurately right with a sensitivity of 97% and specificity of 93% right and uh, so this was for the validation and then test result we actually got a little bit less sensitivity but still you know almost 90% result and this for a small data set that we actually got from for collaborators in tcs 
uh, where they did some experiment in Ortiz Hospital. So this has been, uh, I think, quite an enriching experience so far. So as I mentioned, that time may not be available for me to complete the way I had planned because I still have ECG and EPG signal processing part is left. Uh, but since the almost one hour is over, let me pause here and let me take the questions. Then depending on the audience interest, then I can decide the rest. Or, or let me do one thing. Uh, let me let me make certain concluding remarks. And also acknowledge the contributions of various people. So, so let me talk about the recent trends. So, probably I've already given a hint about the recent trends that uh, data fusion, like you know, fusing signals are at different levels, right? We can use two signals like ECG signal itself could be having multiple leads whether we can use more leads to get more information this could be a very interesting question and it's already being studied similarly you if we have cycles of ECG multiple cycles of ECG can we really create uh, better uh, signals from the multi cycle by forming some kind of a templates in fact we have done some work on templates as well and when there are multiple signals, right, we need synchronous data acquisition between them. Or we may actually fuse the signals at a feature level. That is, we extract features from the signals and then fuse the features and then use them for training. Or we may take a fusion, we may do a fusion at the decision level. That is, we uh, get the multiple different decisions from different classifiers, right? So from ECG signal, we get one decision and from PCG signal, we may get another decision. We fuse them together so that uh, we get a better decision, like a voting logic and things like that. So this is one thing. Another thing that is happening, which I have called as a recent fashion because everybody is doing it. So it's deep learning. So a lot of effort is being put to uh, apply deep learning techniques to get a better and uh, more accurate uh, classification. In fact, I had some results where I have shown you that, uh, I would have shown you that the classification using deep learning is marginally better compared to uh, standard machine learning. Uh, but I think the, the last word is not yet out there. But there are different types of deep learning models. So they could be, you know, tried out, right? So signal-based one-dimensional or image-based two-dimensional or even volumetric 3D, three-dimensional uh, visualizations of ECG and other signals are being attempted to see whether we can actually get a better uh, accuracy of our classification. And let me also conclude with the concluding remarks that you now it's almost 400 years uh, that uh, William Harvey actually has showed that how blood flows in our body, right? Earlier, people used to think that the pure blood, the oxygenated blood flows through the veins and uh, returns to the arteries. And But Harvey showed that it's the other way, right? And he did actually a lot of work and actually experimental work uh, to prove that. So since then, a lot of modeling and other type of work have happened. But these days, you know, there is a new opportunity with the new sensors, and uh, data collections, transmissions, IoT, e and things like that. So, and then wearables and uh, things like that. So every individual person's health can be using uh, this kind of data. So if we have good algorithms, good signal processing, uh, then we can actually detect it quite early rather than waiting till the person is having a chest pain and then has to be operated upon. We can actually detect much earlier that the person's blood pressure or is going up and the AVP signal is not looking good and things like that. So we can actually figure out things much 
earlier. So that's what I meant. So early detection, if we can do, we can do early detection of the of any diseases. Then we can not only prevent a lot of uh, things like heart failure and strokes, uh, but in fact we can actually alert the persons to maintain a certain cardiovascular health, and uh, you know not without needing any other you know actions at the end. So with this, let me acknowledge some of our group members who have contributed to the work. But I could uh, show only the work of Ashutosh and Karuna today, and and of course Karan, as I mentioned, who is an alumnus of this group, and Savon and Apurva, uh, they are working on ECG, and Rajeshwari is working on uh, PCG or phonocardiogram signals. Master students, they are all working uh, in um, different signals. In fact, two of them are working on ECG signal, and one thing I would have. Mentioned in detail, if I got time, is that our team participated in a cardiological challenge on Physionet, and all the way, all being in a novice, still we came up 15th uh, in a team where almost 200 people participated, and finally about 40 teams survived till the last stage. So our team not only survived, but it got the 15th position. And next year there is another upcoming challenge on cardiology, so our team is now very keen to. Participate so a lot of people are interested to work on that and I also mentioned about Rakesh's work which is actually the interpolation of the pina press signal, right? So Rakesh is working on arterial blood pressure and PPG signal, and a lot of uh, group members, new group members are there who have started working since internship and their BTEC projects, and a couple of them have joined more recently. I think we have not got their photographs yet. Uh, so almost six people are working on ECG, EEG, right? And uh, also, uh, Anshul is supposed to look at electrodermal activity signals. We'll see how it works. And some who have uh, already graduated. So Karan and Vibhu, uh, both of them are past PhD students. And Saiful and Gautami, they have been past uh, master students who are now working outside. And then myself and Professor Nirmal Ghosh, we are trying to keep this group together. And so now we're ready for any questions. So I can even ask some of my students to answer in case there is any very specific details and needed regarding any part of the work presentation.